Hello everyone and welcome back to my Let's Play series on the original Formula One game for PlayStation. Yes, it's Formula One. And here we are, we've reached the jewel of the crown. We're at round five and we're at Monaco. Oh my goodness, when we first saw Monaco represented in this game, everyone went absolutely crazy. Yes, I don't think we'd seen a better version of the Monaco circuit represented in a video game, especially on consoles, for a very, very long time. Anyway, our driver, Mr. David Twett Coulthard, is coming into the pits now to make his traditional stop where he takes off some of the fuel. And we're going to increase the downforce, of course, because you need maximum downforce at the torturous Monaco circuit. Anyway, while that's going on, I'm going to give you a little bit of background of the 1995 season. The calendar was initially announced at the beginning of 1995. The European Grand Prix was moved to the Nürburgring circuit. The Argentine Grand Prix was the only newly announced race, with it taking place at the Autodromo Oscar Alfredo Galvez circuit. The circuit was due to begin the season on March the 12th, but there were doubts over whether the circuit would be ready in time. The third race in Japan was also under threat as the TI circuit was badly affected after the Great Hanshin Earthquake, which damaged local infrastructure. The San Marino round, the Spanish round and the Italian round all required safety upgrades. The circuit de Catalunya was also in financial difficulty. On February the 6th, a revised calendar was announced, with the Argentine Grand Prix moved to April the 9th despite the fact that it had now received official clearance from the FIA safety inspector Roland Bruchnard. The Pacific round was moved due to the Kobe earthquake, with it now one week before the Japanese Grand Prix. The European Grand Prix was moved forward seven days, leaving just a seven-day gap between the Portuguese and the European rounds. However, some tracks still needed clearance to race. Although 14 teams and 28 drivers respectively were on the official 1995 entry list, the LaRousse team with drivers Eric Bernard and Christophe Bouchant failed to turn up for any of the on-track sessions. This was due to the team running short of money. In the period prior to the event, with the French government aid not forthcoming and a 1995 chassis not yet built, team owner Gerard LaRousse elected to miss the first two rounds of the season in the hope of competing for the San Marino Grand Prix onwards. No funding ever arrived, however, and it was too late for them to build a car for the season. There were some arrangements with the Dams Formula 3000 team, but Dams bosses wanted to buy LaRousse and run the team themselves. On February the 13th, the boss of Dams, Jean Paul Dritt, announced that they had abandoned their plans to enter Formula 1 for 1995, as he could not find a good amount of sponsorship to run the team at a competitive level. Dritt said that he intended to return to Formula 3000 and prepare for an F1 bid in 1996. LaRousse's withdrawal, in addition to the collapse of the Lotus team after the end of the 1994 season, dropped the number of participating cars to 26, guaranteeing all the entrants of a race start without the threat of failing to qualify for the first time since the 1994 Canadian Grand Prix. The threat of a driver's strike over the terms of the 1995 Federation Internationale des Automobile Super Licenses, which allowed the FIA to demand promotional appearances and forbade the drivers from criticising the championship, this was resolved by the governing body prior to the race, ensuring full driver participation. Of the teams that did appear, all had completely new chassis to cope with the revised technical regulations which stipulated a variety of changes including the reduction of engine capacity and the size of the aerodynamic wings, the introduction of more stringent crash testing, the raising of the car's ride height and more rigorous testing of fuel specifications, all with the aim of reducing speeds and increasing driver safety, a process which had begun in the aftermath of the deaths of Roland Ratzenberger and Ayrton Senna during the weekend of the 1994 San Marino Grand Prix. The cars were still in various stages of development heading into the new season. The Footwork FA16 and the Simtech S951 chassis arrived at the event with virtually no testing, having been completed shortly beforehand. There was one new team in the shape of the Italian 40 outfit, whilst the Benetton, McLaren, Footwork, Jordan Pacific, Ligier and Sauber teams had all changed their engine suppliers in the course of the off-season. Of the initial 1995 drivers, Pedro Deniz was the only complete rookie, whilst Andrea Montemini started his first race after failing to qualify for the 1994 Spanish Grand Prix due to injury. 
Mika Salo and Domenico Scatarella had completed in two races, with Taki Anui completing in one race the previous season. Minardi had been expected to run with Mugen Honda engines, but at the last minute, Ligier boss Flavio Briatore persuaded the Japanese engine supplier to supply Ligier, leaving Minardi in a mess. Their car was designed for the Honda V10 and parts had already been made. The Minardi team had to work flat out to build a brand new car with a Ford ED engine. Team owner Giancarlo Minardi announced he was taking legal action against the Japanese supplier. The status of Ligier and who his owners were was coming under scrutiny. The news that Martin Brundle had signed with them for the 1995 season brought up rumours that Tom Walkinshaw was the new boss of the team. Walkinshaw's move to Ligier from Benetton, where he had been Benetton's engineering director, was part of the agreement between Flavio Briatore and FIA's Max Mosley the previous year to get Benetton regarding the use of an illegal fuel filter in the 1994 German Grand Prix. Benetton admitted that the filter was illegal on the understanding that major changes would be made within the team. Briatore appeared to have asked Walkinshaw to control Ligier. So there you go, there's some history of the 1995 season and as you can see David Quat, Quat, Quat Coulthard has completed his qualifying and it's time for the starting grid at Monaco. Oh my goodness. In pole position, it's Damon Hill in the Williams Renault. Second place, Michael Schumacher in the Benetton Renault. In third position, it's Gerhard Berger. Fourth place, it's John Lacey. In fifth position, it's Mika Hakkinen. Sixth place, Johnny Herbert. Seventh place is Martin Brundle in the Ligier Mugen Honda. In eighth position, it's Eddie Irvine. In ninth place, it's Mark Blundell. Tenth position for Rubens Barrichello. In eleventh position, it's Oliver's Penis. In twelfth place, it's Johnny Morbidelli. In thirteenth place, it's Heinz Harold Frensen. And in fourteenth position, it's Ukio Katayama. Fifteenth goes to Luca Badoa. Sixteenth place for Mika Salo. And seventeenth for Martini. In eighteenth place, it's Bouillon. In nineteenth position, it's David Twat Coulthard and in 20th place it's Scatarella 21st goes to Bertrand Gasho 22nd for Pedro Deniz in the 40 forward 23rd for Joss Verstappen and in 24th it's Roberto Moreno 25th for Montemine and bringing up the rear of the grid is Anui in the footwork heart in 26th place so here we are, the excitement mounts as the five lights go out. It's time to say go, go, go. And it's 19th place for David Twett Coulthard. It's a very, very slow getaway from the line. Almost gets jumped by a 44th there as we go into turn one. Oh, it's contact. Absolute clusterfuck as always. Oh, it's absolute carnage into turn one. The car ahead, I think, is one of the salvers. He's lost his rear wing and David Coulthard manages to go past as we climb up into the hill section. Oh my goodness, uh, he's in 18th position, so he's made one place up and there's still 19 laps remain of this Grand Prix. Very, very long race, of course, as it always is at Monaco, but it is, of course, a very, very short circuit as we now go down the hill, still in the 18th for David Coulthard. Just look at all the cars ahead. We've got a Minardi now, who, as I said earlier, is now in a Ford engine and not a Honda engine as we try and sort of sneak our way around the outside through the... Uh, uh, swimming pool section no we've just gone past the swimming pool section anyway we're just about to go through the tunnel there up into 17th position now for David Twett Coulthard in of course the Williams from 1995 another Minardi in front of us as it goes very very dark through the tunnel and you can see the glorious graphics of the PS1 engine as it looks like a firecracker uh, being set off in reverse yes there's sparkles everywhere but this of course was a PS1 game so we can't really complain too much can we so here we go, 17th for David Twett Coulthard. Is he going to get any points in this race or is it going to be a no-no? Well, we'll find out in a minute, just about to complete the lap one of this race. And the Minardi is still in front and the other man, oh, he's cocked up a little bit there as David Twett Coulthard. It's Martini directly ahead of him now in, of course, that Minardi with the Ford engine, not the Honda one. As he goes past him, yes, up into 16th place for David Coulthard. We've got the Nokia now trying to get past. Oh, does he get past both the Nokia? Says contact him. Yes, he does. Up now into 14th position. David Coulthard is now trying to thread his way through the traffic. Of course, it was a disastrous qualifying for David Coulthard, 19th position. At Monaco, you need to get as high up the grid as you can because there's absolutely no room to pass. As we go down the hill now, look at the hotel in the background that just pops into view. It was absolutely glorious on this game in 1995. As I said, everyone just went crazy for Monaco. 
And of course, in most Formula 1 games, the first place you go to when you first play the game is Monaco, because it used to be fantastic, but unfortunately, these days, it's just a lot of old bollocks. Yes, Monaco's a lot of old bollocks, especially on the Codemasters games. Anyway, let's move on, let's move on. Let's not criticise Codemasters any more than I usually do. Oh, why the bloody hell not? Anyway, oh my goodness, and David Coulthard skips the chicane there, but he managed to get past a few cars, and of course there's no penalty, because there is no actual uh, skipping of the chicane penalty in Formula 1, the original game for PlayStation. No, there's no corner cutting penalty or anything, to be honest. Absolutely nada. No, you can bloody well do what you like, yes, and skip the chicanes. But of course, as everyone knows at Monaco, a lot of the cars actually drive through the barrier, which gives them a slight advantage as well. There's certain places where you'll physically see the cars ahead of you driving straight through the barriers they go into the corners. But anyway, never mind. On to lap two now, trying to get past. Oh, it gets past. Oh, does he? Yes. Past on McLaren as well. And our next target is the Jordan Peugeot. He's up into 10th position, which of course in 2019 standards would be World Championship points. But unfortunately, in 1995, he goes straight into the back of the uh, Jordan Peugeot there. That's, I don't know who that is. It could be Ruby Barrichello or it could be Eddie Irvine, but he's gone past anyway. Up into single figures now for David Coulthard. Ninth position, Michael Schubacher is currently in the lead of this race and he's 22 seconds ahead of David Coulthard at the moment as he's fighting like crazy with his other Jordan. Does he get past? Yes, he does. So up into eighth position now for David Coulthard as we go through the tunnel once more. And it goes very, very dark and you can see not a lot. Yes, so we come out of the tunnel going down this sort of slight gradient as we break very very hard and once again David Coulthard goes for a move on the Ligier I do believe gets past her now up into seventh position yes seventh place now of course David Coulthard doesn't like to cheat on Formula 1 games but when there's this opportunity where you can actually skip the chicane it's too hard to resist because what you have to remember is that they cheat as well because they don't come into the pits and David Coulthard is going to have to come into the pits. So they all gain at least a 25 second advantage by not coming to the pits. So why not? Anyway, we got overtaken there by the Ligier but he's retaken the place now. So Schumacher still in the lead at the moment. Damon Hill in second and Coulthard is still in seventh position. His next target is one of the other McLarens. Just look at the livery on that McLaren. Absolutely glorious. I hate the... Uh, 2019 livery I hated the 20 I just hate the orange it's just it looks very very naff I don't know what uh, everyone else thinks about that but to me it just looks very very naff and doesn't look McLaren-y at all to be honest anyway let's see if David Coulthard can get past this McLaren as we go through the torturous hairpin section there's another car in front of the McLaren and it is a Benetton now Schumacher's in the lead so of course that's going to be Johnny Herbert oh yes and he gets past yes he does so now up into the points for David Twat Coulthard at Monaco yes 19th position to 6th place in about 3 laps that's fantastic absolutely fantastic now he's going to see if he can get past Johnny Herbert that was of course Mika Hakkinen in the McLaren and yes he skips the chicane and does indeed get past Mika Hakkinen up into 5th position now but of course by doing this he's creating quite a bit of damage to the car so hopefully it's going to last but it may not and of course at Monaco it's tight it's torturous it's very very twisty and one little mistake and you're going to end up in the wall and you're going to lose your front wing or your rear wing in fact because you can lose both wings in this game so four laps completed now and now we've got both the Ferraris of Alessi and Berger and one of them's trying to overtake the other as you can see trying to dive down the inside but they're not having any of it still holding their line as David Coulthard now goes for both the Ferraris does he get past yes he does up into third place now and look at this everyone a very rare appearance but he's now behind his teammate Mr Damon Hill in the sister Williams Wow, this is real excitement we've got for you now. It's the battle of the teammates as he tries to get past Damon Hill. Going into this torturous hairpin. Is he going to try and get past Damon here? No, not at the moment. Very, very close to the back of Damon Hill's gearbox now. Very, very close indeed. He tries for a move down the inside. He's going to make his stick this time. And it's contact with Damon Hill. And oh no, he's lost his rear wing. Oh no. He gets into second place, but he's lost his rear wing. But it doesn't really matter. No. Because as I've said in previous episodes, you can lose your rear wing and it makes absolutely no difference to the handling of the car as he dives down the inside now of Michael Schumacher and takes the lead. Yes, he takes the lead of the Grand Prix at Monaco with no rear wing on the car, but it doesn't matter. There's no reduction in handling whatsoever with no rear wing, so he can carry on. 
The only uh, reduction you get is if you lose the front wing and then you get some understeer and over... Oh, it just goes a little bit horrible, but it's still sort of controllable, but not very well. But anyway, so we won't worry. We'll just continue without a rear wing. This is the new look Ben... New look Benetton. This is the new look Williams, everyone. Yes, with no rear wing, as you can see, as David Coulthard crosses the line in first position at Monaco. Oh, my goodness. What a fantastic performance. So Coulthard in the lead now. <laughs> Schumacher in second. Damon Hill in third position. Berger in fourth. Alacy in fifth. And Johnny Herbert is now in sixth position. Of course, uh, David Coulthard is still using the digital D-pad for the steering. Yes, there was no analogue control in F1, the original Formula 1 game for PlayStation. So it's very, very difficult to steer around the corners. You have to stab at the digital pad to get it to go left and right. As you can probably see, the movements of the car are very jerky, which is a fair representation of what David is actually doing with the control pad. Yes, he's stabbing at it. He's not actually uh, doing like a, a complete radius curve that you would get if you were using the analog stick, of course. Um, so that, when that was introduced, I think in 19... Was it 1997 the analog first came in? I think it was. Ape Escape was the first game that had the analog controls, if anyone was interested. Yes, Ape Escape. Everyone thought it was Gran Turismo, but in fact, uh, Gran Turismo uh, 2, was it? Yes, Gran Turismo 2. But it wasn't actually. No, it was Ape Escape, which was the first game to actually use it. Oh, my goodness, there's contact that I've been waffling on from Michael Schumacher. Plow straight to the back of David Coulthard, but he managed to carry on. Still got the front wing on, so he won't have to come into the pits. But yes, as I just said, um, Ape Escape was the first game to use the analog sticks. And then, of course, it was rapidly adopted by all the racing franchises. All of them, yes. Now, I'd just like to clarify what I mean by the analog stick, because I know a lot of you are going to say, hang on a minute. <laughs> hang on a minute. What about, what about Toka Touring Car? Because that came out in 97, and yeah, that had the analog stick. Yeah, well, of course, there was two versions of the analog stick that came out there was a version that came out in 1997 which did not have the rumble feature yes yeah, so i've actually still got that controller it's actually sitting right next to me as i'm just looking down right now yes it had these sort of very weird concave pieces on the analog sticks that your thumb sort of sat into as well not like the raised sections that you get in the modern controllers now no it was sort of like, like pits in them that your thumbs just sort of yeah disappeared into Anyway, I had one of those and it had no rumble feature and in fact the controller was a lot bigger as well than a standard um, PlayStation controller and, and indeed a lot bigger than the, um, the DualShock controller which came out a little bit later. But yes, so for those games, for Touring Car and indeed for Formula 1 97, you could use uh, that analog controller. Anyway, we're coming to the pits now because we're in the lead so David Coulthard decides that yeah, we might as well fix the car up. So we're going to change the front wing and we're going to change the tyres and we're going to put some fuel in the car. But we're not going to bother with the rear wing because as I say it's absolutely pointless because it makes no difference. So there you go. And out we go for David Twet Coulthard. So yes, for those early games, Formula 1 97 and uh, for Toka Touring Car, you could use that uh, analogue controller without the rumble function. Unfortunately for a lot of the games, every time you played it you had to recalibrate the sticks yes which is a bit annoying anyway then the dual shot came along which was a smaller version and it had the full rumble support as well which was just in time for uh, games like Gran Turismo 2 which fully supported the rumble feature of course oh do you remember going through those curbs oh my goodness on Gran Turismo 2 that was that was glorious every time you hit a bump the vibrations just went straight through you and it was it was yeah anyway let's move on from that <laughs> i also remember on gran turismo 2 that uh, they actually had uh, smelly vision yes where the disc actually smelt like burnt rubber do you remember that yes i've still got my version it doesn't quite smell like burnt rubber anymore though i have to say no it sort of smells a little bit strange <laughs> Anyway, let's move on back to the race now. And so um, David Coulthard has made his pit stop and he rejoins now in 17th position behind a lot of the back markers, as you can see. And one of those back markers, I can't quite see who it is. I think, is that a Sauber? Is that a Sauber ahead of us or is that the MTV car? I think that may be the MTV car, in fact. So 17th for David Twett Coulthard. It's just for Stappen ahead of us, as you can see, he's just about to come round 
this corner now and see if we can get those three cars all in a row very very tightly bunched up which means it's going to be almost impossible for David Coulthard to manage to get past them but he's going to make a move for it I think he's going to make a move down inside of one of them oh two of them two of them in fact there's contact once more very very tight and there's the Jordan Peugeot he gets past that as well so up into 14th position now for David Coulthard after his stop as he climbs up the hill underneath the Foster's sign and he tries to uh, catch up to the next car which is one of these Nokia's of course this of course I think it's, that's the Tyrrell again isn't it I keep forgetting I have to look to my yes it's the Nokia Tyrrell Yamaha I've just looked across to my notes once again yes of course driven by Katayama Gabriel Tarquini and Mika Salo once more so can we get past and there's more contact more contact with the Tyrrell going into the tunnel now of course there's no place to pass going through the tunnel absolutely no place to pass whatsoever and we go back into the daylight now and a lot of the um, Formula 1 games later on that went really really bright to uh, simulate the oh no he's made contact with the wall trying to get past the Tyrrell Yamaha and he makes contact with the wall as I was saying uh, a lot of the later Formula 1 games it went really really bright as you came out of the tunnel to try and simulate the fact that um, your eyes were trying to adjust to the light it's a very very clever effect in fact and some of the PS1 games had that as well. So it wasn't just a next technology game. No, some of the old ones had it as well. I think uh, F1 Grand Prix 99 had it. Anyway, 13th position now. Unlucky for some, but not for David Coulthard. Because he's already made his stop. So all he has to do now is continue going. And see if he can catch up and indeed pass all these cars in front. He's driving, as I said, once more with no rear wing because it makes no difference whatsoever. And all oh, this contact, though, that was a Sauber. That was a Sauber. And he's up now into 11th place. Yes, 11th place as he climbs the hill once more, breaking very, very late. Very, very late indeed as he now goes down into this right-hander into the uh, casino hairpin. I think that's what it's called. Yes, there's three cars ahead of him. One of them is the other two. Then we've got a Jordan Peugeot. And in front of the Jordan Peugeot, we have a McLaren. So, going through the tunnel once again. 11th place at the moment for David Coulthard. And of course, the glorious Williams from 1995, which almost won the championship, but didn't. But they tried their best. They tried their best. So is he, Now, fortunately, he tried to skip the chicane there, but he couldn't because there was cars ahead of him. So he hasn't gained any time or positions there with Schumacher still in the lead after 10 laps. Now almost 10 seconds ahead of David Coulthard. Of course, David Coulthard then sort of left this team and joined uh, McLaren, didn't he? And I think that was a smart move and it was just in time because McLaren were just about starting to come back. And yes, it was of course in 1998 when McLaren really, really did come back with their car, which was absolutely unbeatable. Of course, the problem for David Coulthard was that his teammate was Mika Hakkinen. And Mika Hakkinen was absolutely unbeatable. So poor David Coulthard had quite a job just trying to keep his head above water, which he did quite a few times. And in fact, he hit Mika Hakkinen uh, did he more than once I think it was who remembers on that podium with Mika Hakkinen's face oh my goodness he could have sunk a battleship with that face <laughs> talk about upset and disappointed with David oh you could not you could not explain it you really couldn't but yes that was a sight to see for Mika Hakkinen <laughs> and of course don't forget there was that time when he went off and cried in the bushes I think that was in 1999 wasn't it yes very emotional man was Mika Hakkinen like all things I do believe anyway so as he manages to skip the chicane this time he's still trying to chase up to the back of this McLaren can he get past can he get past well we will see in a moment as we once again go underneath the Foster's sign Schumacher's got a fastest lap Coulthard is in 8th position with a McLaren in front of him and he's got other cars in front of him as he has to break very very late there very very late break oh he's hit the barrier for David Coulthard got to be very very careful he doesn't get any more damage to that front wing there's still quite a few laps to go I do believe so he's got to be careful rear wing of course doesn't matter whatsoever as he now goes for a move and he's got the Ligier as well oh my goodness he gets past the McLaren now up into seventh place now trying to do a move on the Ligier as we climb up the hill can he get past there's a Benetton in front of the Ligier there's just no room no room at all 
as you can see. The cars, of course, were very, very wide in the 1995 season. They've gone through stages of being wide and thin and wide and thin again, of course. They were wide for this season, even though it's actually been... Oh, no, it's contact, though, from the McLaren. Unbelievable scenes, but it's OK. Now, of course, I think they were a little bit thinner in 1995, weren't they? Because they were thicker in 94, I do believe. That was the first raft of technical changes that were starting to appear in 1995. Then, of course, they went super thin for 1998. Oh, my goodness. They were, they were like super model thin, weren't they? Super model thin for 1998. And then, uh, slowly, they started to get wider again. And then they went narrow again. And of course, I think 2016 they were quite narrow, weren't they? And then, of course, for 2017, they went all big and butch again. And now they're even more bigger and butcher for 2019. They'll sort it out one day. I'm sure they will. <laughs> anyway, oh no! Disastrous for David Coulthard. Absolutely disastrous. He's taken the rear wing off the Benetton in front of him, which of course is, uh, of course, uh, Herbert. But now his front wing has gone on the car. The front wing has gone on the car for David Coulthard. He's going to have handling issues. You can see he's sort of going from left to right and really trying to get a hold on this handling, which of course is going to be absolutely disastrous at Monaco. And I think he's decided now that if he's going to get any points, he's just going to have to go for it. Yes, so that's what he's going to do. I don't think now David Coulthard is going to come into the pits as he goes past his teammate Damon Hill. No, he's decided. He's now said to himself, oh, fuck it. Oh, fuck it. I'm just going to go for it and see if I can get some points before the end of this race. Not quite sure how many laps there are until the end. Now, of course, luckily, there's no suspension damage in this game. So he can bash against the walls like Billio, and it won't make any difference to the handling of the car. The only difference in the handling of the car is, of course, the loss of the front wing. And they, oh, no, he's plowed straight into the barrier. And Damon Hill gets past. He's lost a place now. Down to fifth position for David Twet Coulthard. But can he make any inroads now? You can see he's fighting like crazy, trying desperately to hold it onto the circuit. But of course, it does. It gives you a very, very weird effect, I have to say. It's like you're steering too much when you hit the steering. Yes, that's what happens when you lose the front wing and he plows straight into the back of Damon Hill. And there's more contact. I think there's another car. To, as McLaren's trying to get past him. And even more contact. But he's holding on to fifth position. Hopefully, he might actually manage to get into the points, even though. He's cheating a little bit, a little bit, but uh, we'll just carry on. There's no point now in coming into the pits because there's not many laps left. And if he comes into the pits, he's going to end up completely out of the points and probably about 16th. So he's just going to say, fuck it, and just keep going now, keep going. And he tries to split the Ferraris in two, and he manages to, and he's in the middle of a Ferrari sandwich now. Still, of course, with the horrible handling issues of the car. He dives down the inside, and he can't break in time either. Oh, no, there's more contact from the other Ferrari. Well, well, it's a bit of luck. There is no suspension damage in this, car, in this game. Otherwise, uh, he'd be knackered by now. Absolutely cream-crackered, because there wouldn't be any wheels left. So we go through the tunnel now. Still chasing after the Ferrari. He's up into third again. And oh, he almost went contacting the tunnel once again. But let's see if he manages to improve on third. As he tries to move on this Ferrari. But he didn't quite manage to pull that off. Of course, the handling issues are really, really slowing him down at the moment. I think that means Michael Schumacher must still be in the lead. Yes, it is. There he is after 13 laps. Oh, there was 19 laps, wasn't there? In total. So there's um, 13... 14, Oh my goodness, there's still six laps to go for David Twett Coulthard. This could be very, very dodgy indeed, but of course he's not going to lose any more um, of his parts of his car because he's lost all the parts that he can lose from the car. Yes, but he's in third place, still fighting with this Ferrari. And he's now 11 seconds behind Michael Schumacher because he tries to go down the inside of John Alessi. Of course, the Frenchman in the Ferrari, the V12 Ferrari. Very, very heavy car in 1995. Very, very heavy indeed. Oh no, he's taken the rear wing off. John Alessi, he won't be very happy with that. He'll be sitting in that car now going, Oh, mon dieu! Mon dieu, David! Mon dieu, David! And all stuff like that. I don't know. I don't know what I'm talking about half the time. <laughs> So up now into second place for David Coulthard. And he's now trying to get past a 40-fold, yes, the almighty 40-fold, all in yellow, which I'm sure Eddie Jordan probably stole for uh, 
the next previous seasons. Or should I say the next season? Oh no, there's contact though. As he just went past Michael Schumacher. Oh my goodness, into up into first position now for David Coulthard. Well, I take it back. I think he is going to win this race. Slightly, um, how can I put it? Cheating a little bit, but I do believe David Coulthard is going to win this Grand Prix. Okay, so I have accelerated forward a tiny little bit because nothing's really happened for about the past five laps. And it looks like David Coulthard, as I said, is going to finish in the lead. He's finally going to win. I think he's won already, isn't he? I can't remember. Anyway, if he hasn't, he's finally going to win a Grand Prix. Slightly cheating. Oh, I'm very, very cheating. But he's going to cross the line in first position. Johnny Herbert's just pulling our fastest lap. I think we've still got one more lap to go, though, I do believe. I think we're on lap... 18 out of 19 as he crosses the line yes he is there you go there's lap 18 just one more lap to go now as he tries to go past this i think that was elysio gerhard Berger is now in second position oliver's penis is in third place and as you can see there's confirmation on screen this is the last lap and ukio katayama oh my goodness that can't be true can it is in fourth place ukio katayama is in fourth position damon hills in fifth and Heinz Held Fredson is in sixth place. Of course, Heinz Held then went on later in his career to drive this Williams in um, 1997. Of course, he replaced Damon Hill, who went off to Arrows after winning the 1996 World Championship. Yes. So there you go then, the final dying seconds of this Grand Prix. David Coulthard is indeed going to win at Monaco. The crowds are going crazy in the background. Just look, just look at the beautiful crowd effect. Just look at it. All those hundreds and thousands everywhere. Just look at them. Look, they're all cheering and saying, Come on, David! Come on, David! Oh, it's glorious. And one of those hotels is actually owned by David Coulthard. Yes, he owns a hotel in Monaco. Yes. Well, of course he would do, wouldn't he? Anyway, so he's just about to cross the final start finish line to cross the line and win the race at Monaco fantastic wowzers absolute wowzers so there you go David Coulthard won the race Gerhard Berger in second Oliver's penis in third position and Ukio Katayama in fourth well there you go that's Monaco for you so after five championship rounds David Coulthard is now in third position with 17 points Michael Schumacher in the lead with 23 and in the constructors 39 for Williams oh my goodness well there you go there's round five at Monaco and as always thanks so much for watching everyone and as always we will be back with more videos later